Hello Wax YouTube, uh, thanks for being here today for those of you who are watching us um, and obviously thank you to Tommy who is sat here with me as well. Um, how are you doing? Very well, thanks, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, definitely ready to learn more about how to be a filmmaker so I can <laughs> run away and go do that. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here. Excellent, so um, do you want to start off by just introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, sure. So my name's Tommy Rowe of Rowe Films. I'm a creator filmmaker from the Southwest. Um, I do all sorts of different work from weddings and events to commercial work, music videos, YouTube content, branded films, some collaboration work. Um, I like to keep it mixed and varied. Most recently, I've been um, working with the guys at Atomos and Lumix on some promotional material for their upcoming releases for ProRes Raw. Um, and I'm also a musician and a drummer. I've been in a band for about 17 years. I know I don't look old enough. Um, so yeah, that's me really. Amazing. So um, can you tell us a little bit about the kind of filmmaking or content creation that you um, particularly specialize in or, or perhaps your favorite kind? Oh, good question. Um, to be honest, when I started my journey, I I kind of didn't want to, I know lots of people kind of pick a niche um, and go with that. Whereas for me, I enjoy so many aspects of the job and so many different lines of work that I like to keep myself open to all sorts, really. So as I said a minute ago, it's, you know, commercial work is a big one. Wedding films I love. Music videos are fantastic as well because they kind of combine my two loves in life, which is music and film. Um, and a little bit of photo and things comes into that, but not very much. I try to stick with try to stick with video. Um, what else can I say? I've been doing quite a bit of kind of collaborations with brands and things like that, which is always fun and exciting, getting to work with new people. Um, I think you've got a showreel of mine to play. Maybe that might be not a bad time to play it because it should show people the kind of work that I do. And I've kind of picked some of my most recent and favourite work um, and thrown it together. So might be a good time to play that maybe. Absolutely. So let's cool. have a little look at some of the work that you've done. share that today thank you thanks very much um i can see what you mean the range is very vast and very varied um yeah. but i guess one thing straight off the bat that i would ask you is um you can definitely tell in that work that it's yours 
Oh, thank you. That's a huge compliment. Thanks. <laughs> Could you talk to us a little bit about um, how you found that style and, and give some people advice on what they can do to try and find their own? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I think we'll probably come on to it in a minute, but um, it comes from the journey of starting out, really. I think it takes a while. Um, it does take quite a long time to start to develop your own style and things. And I think for me, it came from really just focusing on what I love um things that have inspired me you know I'm a massive movie fan so I think a lot of my work is heavily inspired by movies and and that kind of look I love a bit of a vintage look a little bit filmic um and it comes from you know like almost an obsession really of, of love for the craft I suppose in the sense that you know I'm ever since I began I work by day and then study and learn by night and I think that process is never ending really you're always learning you know I think I've probably watched every single interview with say Roger Deakins for example and you know it's it may not even be related to the kind of work you want to do but you just learn so much and then over time you start to develop your own style and I think that happens pretty organically really um I don't think it should be forced I think it just happens um you start to learn what you like, what you don't like, um, you know, things like color grading and things. It's always an ongoing process. Um, and I would probably say to anyone who's kind of starting out is, is try not to force it. I think let it happen naturally. Um, and I always do think try and take a, an approach that's potentially different to others. That's always a good thing. I think if you can try and stand out in that sense. Um, but let the process happen naturally. And I think over time, you, you just naturally develop your own look and your own style. And, and then eventually people start coming to you for that, um, which is amazing and all you can really ask for um, if people are coming to you because they love what you do. And I think as long as you do you, I suppose, it's a bit of a cliche. And, uh, it, you know, if you just let it come from you, try not to do it to impress other people or anything like that. Do it for you. Um, and if you love it, that it just happens, it happens organically. So that would be my advice on that. Would you say um, having your own style, something that sets you apart, would you say that's important to being a filmmaker? Um, I like to think so. Um, you know, I suppose it's part of my journey, which to be honest, again, I'm sure we'll come on to that, but it's, it's not been a decades long thing. You know, I think if I had to say I've got to where I am and I think that the look of my work and the kind of, vibe of it has played a big part in that so I would say yes because I think it's great if somebody can see a video I've had lots of messages before people who have seen a video and they didn't even didn't know it was me but they knew it was me if that make makes sense and and I think you said that similar at the beginning and that's a huge compliment and you know it's great it's absolutely great because then people start to come for you for your work and what you do because they love what you do and that's that's fantastic and it helps you kind of set yourself apart from other people who are doing the same thing as you. Yeah, amazing. Um, so we are live just for anyone who's in the audience. So if you pop your questions in the chat, we will get through them as we go. Um, but the first question I have for you is, let's talk about how it actually is to be a filmmaker, to work in filmmaking. Um, can you talk to me about how you find it and sort of maybe your average day? Okay. Um... Well, I suppose in a nutshell, I love it. Um, I think I'm one of those, what appears to be a fortunate few, I suppose, that I'm doing something for a living that I would be doing anyway, if it wasn't, you know, I'd be doing it as a hobby if it wasn't earning me a living. So I absolutely love what I do. Um, you know, so fulfilling, so rewarding, so creative. And if you're a creative person to have that outlet in your life and earn a living from it, you know, what more can you really ask for? So that's yeah I mean it's also hard work a lot of hard work and I think one of the biggest takeaways for me of my journey so far is I mentioned the word obsession earlier but I really do put it down to that you've kind of if you love what you do you, the obsession naturally comes so then all you it's all you want to do um and then it doesn't quite feel like hard work if that makes sense um but you know like I said I spend my day shooting editing doing all the not so interesting stuff like admin and marketing and all of that stuff. But then by evening I'm online 
and I'm learning, you know, and it's not even necessarily filmmaking learning. It's just studying other arts and it might be a painter or a sculptor. You know, you take something away from all of it. And I'd say being online and studying is, is massive. Um, watching behind the scenes features and things is huge, too, because you get to learn how other people operate and why they do things the way they do. Um, so it's kind of just always expanding your knowledge. Um, but it's a lot of hard work, you know, you've got to put in the hours, um, depending on what kind of work you do, what line of work. So with weddings, for example, you know, they're a much smaller part of my kind of work life now. But if you do weddings, for example, it's a lot of weekends. Um, so, you know, your weekends are full, are full especially in the summer. Um, so that's big. It's a lot of hard work. And as I said, just, it, but it's amazing. And, you know, there's no better satisfaction, for example, than handing over a, a client film that is going to do their business wonders or handing over a wedding film that they're going to watch for the rest of their lives and, you know, can live back those memories forever. And, you know, you've, man you've brought them to tears with joy. It doesn't, there's no greater feeling than that. So, yeah, I mean, I'd recommend it to anyone if, if you love film and photo and, you know, all things creative like that, I'd recommend it to anybody. That's fantastic. And like I said, I've, I've seen a lot of your work and it's all incredible. So um, it's really Thank great you. to have you here. Um, I guess based on what you've just said about weddings, yeah. I have a question about how the last year has been for you as a filmmaker with the ever president um COVID. <laughs> so, you know um, how have you found that last year and what have you been up to um okay so coming out of 2019 um weddings did play a big part of the work that I was doing um quite substantially and my, my plan kind of longer term was always to diverge more um and you know keep a good balance of different lines of work for reasons I said earlier you know I just I love so much different work. There's things I get out of lots of different lines of work and, and I want to have kind of my foot in them all, if that makes sense. Um, but coming out of 2019, weddings did play a huge part in um, in my work. So when this happened, it you know, it was a pretty substantial hit. I mean, the wedding industry took a absolute beating um, and in some ways still is. Um, so at first it was, um, how to put it, it's, yeah, it was worrying. And, you know, you just it was almost like the rug being completely torn out from under your feet. And it felt like overnight. So there was then a lot of many weeks of, you know, trying to assist the couples as best as you can. And, you know, there was lots of postponing and postponing again and postponing again. And, you know, there was a huge workload involved there. And one of the difficulties was that taking up so much time that it kind of took away a little bit of time for other things as well. So there was a knock on effect with that too. Um, but it was tough. And I, I think I am lucky in the way that I've, you know, I did have other lines of work that I was doing so I could try and pick up more of that. Um, and I know there's a lot of guys out there who predominantly focus on weddings, whether that's because, you know, they, they don't get other work or they don't want other work. Um, and obviously the hit was huge and, I've come out of it okay and you know there's a lot of people out there who have who've really suffered so yeah it's been really tough but hopefully now things are starting to improve and uh yeah the, the so for me really the, co the commercial side of things took over whilst we waited to see what happened with the with the weddings so I do still have a few left um so I'm looking forward to them I did one uh, a couple of weeks ago um, which was amazing and to be honest made me realize just how much I've missed them um, just being back in that environment and I think the thing I love most about weddings is you know as a filmmaker and someone who loves story I, I think my a lot of my work focuses in on a story and I love to kind of play with emotion and pull at people's heartstrings a little bit so with a wedding as a filmmaker what you've got in front of you is the strongest emotion that exists you know like the, the whole day is about love and families coming together and which is awesome so it, yeah it was almost like I didn't realize how much I'd missed it until I, I got back to it a couple of weeks ago so yeah would you say I guess this is a question from myself but um, <clears throat> hopefully it's relevant to those watching but would you say that wedding 
uh, filmmaking or content creation is a good way to get started if you're looking to sort of build a business. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so for me, my journey really, it's, it's started from a very young age. I always loved video and photo. And even from a little boy, I would steal my dad's home video camera with a tape in it. Um, and my friends would come over and we'd make scary films, you know, from a long, from a very, very little lad. Um, and then as I got a bit older, I started to like landscape photography, things like that. Um, and as I said earlier, I joined a band when I was 15, um, which I'm still in now. So that's over half of my life. But um, that also played a huge part in it as well, because I um, kind of took it upon myself to be responsible for the band's photos and music videos. Um, and I shot a few music videos for the band and realised that, well, I thought I was quite fairly good at it. Um, and that's what sparked this journey then um, to, to go full time eventually, which was which was great. Um, sorry, I've run away. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering if, if you would say, I think you've probably already answered it, but if you would yeah. say that weddings is a good way in. For yeah, definitely. That's right. Yeah. So I was working full time in a completely unrelated job. Um, let's just say it wasn't for me. Um, and I got to the point, I just made the decision that I wanted to give this a go full time. And once I've made my mind up, that was it. And weddings I saw as a bit of a way in. Um, I shot a couple of weddings for friends, uh, you know, a couple of friends for my partner. And I tried to do them a bit differently. I tried to, you know, produce them in a way that is perhaps a bit different to how other people are doing it. And the power of social media um, you know, the reach is massive. And before you knew it, you know, people were talking and it allowed me to, you know, well, saying that I actually left my job with no bookings at all, um, which was a bit scary. But yeah, I just went both feet first. And before you know it, once you've shot a couple of weddings for friends or whatever, you know, do your best with them. And, and then the bookings come in then. So absolutely, I think weddings was a good way in. Um, and then from there, I kind of started to diverge. Perfect. Um, so we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, the first question, I guess, was something we, we sort of hinted at earlier, but um, Scott's asked, uh, is there a filmmaker or a director that you would say is your inspiration or is somebody that you love? I know obviously you mentioned Roger Deakins, which is mm -hmm. hard not to love. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I'm, I'm, directors wise, I'm, I'm a huge Nolan fan, uh, Christopher Nolan. Um, I love his storytelling. Um, and the way he plays with time and things like that. Um, so he's a huge inspiration. I think a couple of my wedding films, there's, there's even little kind of Nolan inspiration in there hidden away. Um, cinematography wise, yeah, I'd say Deakins is a huge one. Massive fan of everything he's done. And, you know, he's proper old guard. Been doing it for so long. Um, just, yeah, he's one of those living legends, isn't he, Roger Deakins? So, you know, films like 1917 all of that stuff are just incredible so that they've been a huge inspiration um and then all the others really you know um tarantino all of that i've got quite a few i'm just a huge movie fan and i think when i watch let's just say my partner gets a little bit frustrated i think when watching a film because you can just see i'm analyzing everything <laughs> but that's part of the enjoyment for me you know and i'm, I'm always learning from what other people are doing and not even Hollywood directors as well, you know, other wedding filmmakers, other even YouTubers, you know, other creatives. Um, you know, it's been great working with Lumix um, because I've kind of got to know a little bit, a couple of their other um, creatives who work for them. And, you know, I, I take inspiration from them too. You know, their work's fantastic. Um, so, yeah. I don't blame you. I mean, I think when I was watching 1917, it was in the mm -hmm. cinema and my friend was listening to me go, wonder how they got that shot <laughs> yeah the grading so nice <laughs> oh, i know yeah it's, it's a masterpiece that one it was beautiful <laughs> a, a couple of a couple of um friends of mine actually um we recently uh tracked down the tree that both in the <laughs> intro and the outro because they're, they're in wiltshire and um i spent a whole day looking to see where this tree was um, just because I would, I wanted to try and recreate that end shot where he's walking up to the tree. Um, so we went and we did it and I, eventually I've got to put it on YouTube, but I haven't edited anything yet. <laughs> well, I feel like I know what my next break's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
we've got a couple of questions coming in about kit so i guess it's time to sort of rip the band-aid off here yeah. um so the person who's asked the questions actually asked about your lighting equipment um, mm -hmm. but do you want to give us a little bit of perspective of your camera lens and lighting and then we yeah. can go from there yeah sure um so my primary camera is all lumix um, I'm sure I'll come on to why in a bit, but I shoot uh, predominantly on the GH5S, especially now that it's ProRes RAW, um, the BGH1 and the GH5 too. Um, so that's cameras, lenses, a um, bit of a mix really. Um, I've got a few kind of native micro four thirds lenses, um, and then I also adapt kind of, you know, EF lenses um, and also some vintage lenses as well, which I love and seem to really suit my work. Um, and then obviously there's all the hardware, gimbals, rigs, um, and all of that stuff, audio as well. Um, lighting wise, yeah, th this is massive. I think often there's a lot of emphasis placed on cameras and rightly so. Um, but you know, lighting is so important and, you know, I've invested quite a bit in lighting. So I use, um, Aperture, Godox, um, what else have we got here? Um, the Pavo tubes, Nanlite Pavo tubes, um, and I've actually got a Falcon Eyes panel on me now. So quite a bit, quite a big mix, really. Some, most of it's um, daylight or bicolor, um, and then a bit of RGB as well because they come in handy. Um, and yeah, lighting's huge. Lighting's really massive. So I've, I've been investing quite a bit in that. I think the thing with kit is as well is it that that investment takes a long time, um, you know, and it and it's always ongoing. So. so if we were talking to someone who's just getting started and maybe isn't on as big a budget or is looking at their first piece of kit, could you recommend sort of one camera, one lens and maybe one piece of lighting just to get them started? Sure. Um, oh, it's tough. This is the thing with the gear these days. There's so many options, isn't there? Um, cameras for me, definitely. I mean, it's all a personal taste and you know at the end of the day all all cameras are fantastic these days let's be honest you know they're all great and great for creating things but i am a fan of lumix um i think there's something about as a filmmaker the the, the look of lumix footage that i just love um it's got a it's all really difficult to put your finger on but it's kind of got like a character to it that i don't personally find i get with I get with others um, and it just really suits my look and, and, and the look that I'm going for. So for me, the good old GH5, I mean, it's, it's still in my kit and it was released in 2017 and, and it is still awesome. Um, the first, as soon as I bought a Lumix camera, that was it. I just, I loved their gear and obviously I've tried the S1H as well and, and uh, you know, the S line. Um, but the GH5 is a, uh, I can honestly say I don't think there's you can get better value for money for what you're getting in a camera than the GH5. I, I genuinely can't think of a alternative that gives you so much functionality and looks so great um, for the money. I think it's um, so I would say GH5. And in fact, I've got a friend at the moment who I work with very closely and he's a photographer of many years, highly, highly skilled photographer. And um he's starting just to look at video and things and experimenting with video. And he said, I'm getting a GH5. So there you go. And I totally agree with him. Yeah. I think that's definitely true that if you're just getting started, you know, look for something that's within your price range and then practice with it. The better you get, you can increase your camera, but obviously you don't want to blow all of your money on one really expensive camera and then realize you need some lighting. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you said lens and light as well, didn't you? So, my workhorse um, is the um, Panasonic 12 to 35 F 2.8 Mark II, I think it is. Um, that is, well, it's the equivalent roughly of the full frame 24 to 70, isn't it? Approximately. So it's just so versatile and it's nice and fast. Um, and I think if you was to pair a GH5 with the 12 to 35 as a, you know, a starter kit, that's a that's a really strong start uh, that would be my recommendation um lights i mean there's lots of options there too um i think aperture they've just brought out some really good uh, is it the amran 200 d and 200 x um yeah. they are great value really good output really good um quality of light 
and then there's also the um the godox fixtures as well so if if you were to pick up um you know the sl60 for example it's a fantastic little light and really good value for money and a small soft box or something you know a bit of diffusion and you've got a really great setup to get you started there Excellent. Thank you so much. I think that's really helpful for people to be aware of. We also have a great use section um, and it comes with a year warranty. So don't be afraid to buy something someone else has used. It normally works perfectly fine. I've done that lots. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple of questions coming in um, with different areas around pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first question is from Rob and he's asked, uh, what are your thoughts on pricing for models? And do you normally deal with that yourself? Pricing for models. Yeah, so I guess what he's asking is how much money you would pay a model, which I know is a difficult one because it does vary. Pay a model. Yeah. Um, to be honest, it's not something I've done a huge amount of. Um, <laughs> difficult one. I suppose uh, I'd, I'd be asking for quotes, I would suppose. So paying for a model to shoot, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would be... <laughs> Or, or does he mean paying a model? Shall we cover both, Rob? <laughs> um, yeah, let's let's talk about both. So um, I can answer the question of um, how much I would pay a model um, working for WEC. We would normally pay them around £200 for four hours. But I guess yeah. maybe, Tommy, you would pay them differently? Yeah, I suppose that's... That seems fair, I suppose. As I said, I've not really done much hiring of models, really. Um, I did do that in the in um, my recent film for Atomos and Lumix. Um, obviously, I'm not. I don't want to go into what you know what I agree with them, but yeah, I'd say I'd say that would sound pretty fair. And I suppose it would depend on who they are and how in demand they are, and you know how good they are. Um, but yeah, I would say I would say that sounds fair for that kind of thing. It appears I have. Um misread Rob's question and Rob has just uh, corrected us so he's asking about pricing in general as a videographer and a filmmaker which is actually a question that's come in from a few people right um, cool. before I hand over to you I just want to put a caveat on this mm -hmm. that as filmmakers and content creators the price completely varies so um, I wouldn't take these prices that we're going to discuss now as the solid go-to prices these are just suggestions so over to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pricing is a big one. I think when you're starting out, you know, you've got to you've got to establish yourself. You've got to build a reputation. And um, a big part of that comes from, uh, you know, going out potentially for free a few times at the very beginning, you know, and, and to build your por portfolio that way. Um, and then the, I can know pricing is difficult because, as you said, it depends massively on on what type of work depends massively on the person and kind of I think lots of different filmmakers and production companies and things they all kind of approach it a little bit differently um so for me when I started you know it, I was doing you know wedding films for a few hundred at the very beginning um just to get them booked in and then what I was doing is kind of with each one I would just up the price a bit and then you know a couple of years down the line you've you've got up to a you know a pretty healthy sum for each wedding you know um commercials different again um off, often you know if it um if i get a commercial inquiry for something i will ask what the budget is um that really helps to approach it that way so that you can kind of learn you know what they're looking to spend and then that will dictate what you can do within that budget um but as a general rule um yeah it varies hugely and if, if you're in demand ultimately you can you can start charging very very good money um if people really love what you do and they want you and only you um so again and it also depends massively on the job if if it's a 60 second promotional film for a local firm it, it might not take too long um to put together so the way i would approach that is you know kind of factor in the time to shoot the time to edit um and in the commercial world as well, you know, the kit you have and things, um, the production value you, that you can bring to that, that also plays a part. Um, commercial is more difficult because it's not like you can go onto a filmmaker's website and look at a list of prices. 
um, to see what others are charging. So in the commercial world, it's often, we want this, how much would it cost you to produce that for us? Um, and then you will probably find that lots of different filmmakers are charging wildly different figures. Um, so ultimately, I think as well, it comes down to how much do you want to earn to earn a living as well? You know, because how much work do you need to earn the amount that you, you know, need to live on or want to be earning? And then how many jobs are you getting? And you can kind of start to work out what you need to be charging that way as well. So I hope that helps. I don't want to be too vague, but um, uh, yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, that does help. I think you're right. It does depend on project as well. You know, if you're shooting a Hollywood documentary, then obviously it's going to cost more money than if you're yeah. shooting a good webinar. Um, I mean, this, the, exactly. I mean, the scope is huge. So if, uh, like, what's a commercial promo? I mean, it could be something that you could shoot in the morning and edit the next day and it's done. Or it could be something that you're, you know, working towards for, for weeks. So it varies so much it's really difficult to say what should I be charging for a commercial job because it's you know like I said it's a little bit like how long is a piece of string but another way you could approach it is to kind of work out what you think you're worth hourly for example so then when somebody comes to you and says I want you to produce this for me you can start to calculate well I think that would take me x number of days or hours um, and then you use your hourly rate that you've got in your mind to work out what you're going to what you're going to charge and i think you quickly start to learn what you should be charging um you know because i think you'll have people snap your hands off um and then you end up mad busy in which case you may need to put your prices up yeah i think what you touched upon there is really interesting um you know working out your hourly rate is probably quite beneficial if you're just getting started because it's quite an easy thing to then convert into cost yeah, and even if you're not quoting it, even if it's just in your own mind, just to work out so that you feel happy with what you're what you're going back with, um, you don't even necessarily have to tell them I'm X amount per hour. Do you see what I mean? You can just say, uh, I've got in my own mind that I, I'm looking for that amount per hour. I expect it to take me that long, and that will help inform what you can put in with a quote. Amazing. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, it is a difficult one because I know it does vary between filmmakers and I guess the more established you are, obviously the higher your fee is going to be. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's a that's a big one. And it happens over time. It takes a little while, but you, you do get up to you get up to a good living. So um, that seems like a really good place to ask a question that's come in about um, when you get started. How do you get started? You know, you're a filmmaker, you've got some show reels, you're feeling good about yourself. What now? What now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so where am I going from here? Yeah, so what would you do if you were back at the beginning of your career and you're, oh, okay. you know, you're looking for work? How did you get that work? How did people find out about you? Okay, yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's a lot that comes into that. It, it, a lot of things comes into it. I think some of which we've, we've kind of um, touched on a little bit already. Um, I would say at the heart of it, I think, how to put it? I think at the heart of it, it's you, your work needs to come from you. And, it, and if, you're, if you're doing it for you, that this sounds very airy-fairy, I know, but it, I do genuinely believe it. But I think if you're doing something that you love, that comes across in the, in the end result of the work. And I think the foundation of it for me is when you're new and looking for work is try and create something that's maybe a little bit different, perhaps, to what other, to what other people are doing. Um, I'd caveat that by saying don't try and be really different just for the sake of being really different. You know, it has to it has to be for a reason. But if you can somehow make your work stand out, that really helps. Um, I would say another big one is kind of networking and getting to know other people in your field, um, you know, um, being social, going to socials, that kind of thing. Social media is obviously massive. I'm sure we'll come on to that. Um, I would say for me as well, being someone who's um, good to work with maybe is huge. I think I always try to be someone that others enjoy working with um, because then ultimately, you know, if you, build up those relationships and people enjoy working with you then 
they'll recommend you and and they'll want to work with you again um but at the very start when you're just starting out it's it's i would say go out and shoot everything um if you're going out for a walk on a sunday afternoon take your camera with you put it on youtube um it's all practice it's all building up a, a bit of a portfolio and a show reel offer to do some things for people you know whether that be film their wedding for them um if you've got a friend who owns a cafe i don't know you know go in and shoot something for them um and then bit by bit you start to build up that portfolio people see what you've done um and then and then obviously you start to get paid work um and it happens pretty quickly i, I would just say if you're producing something that comes from you and and is authentically you then people will connect with it if you see what i mean people will connect with it and then they'll want to book you themselves um yeah. what else would there be just trying to think so i'd say that's all the foundation of it but then on top of that obviously there's all the marketing bits having a website with your with your work on it social media is huge um what else yeah i think i think that's it yeah I mean, while we're on the topic of social media, <laughs> so um, as a filmmaker, what platforms would you say are the vital ones to you? As film, uh, well, for me personally, it's YouTube. I know it's not technically a, so a social media platform, but um, it's probably the thing that I've put the most effort into, I suppose. Um, and I guess it's because it's the best platform for video, I suppose. Um, Instagram's good too, um, but I would say for me, it's been YouTube definitely. And I think, um, again, because I just post things that, you know, I'm very passionate about and I think people have connected with that. So the growth that I have had on YouTube is, has been quite organic and got a nice little community on there now of people who comment. And I'd say that's another big one too, is taking the time to um, thank people, you know, for commenting you know, um, engage with the comments, answer questions, answer messages that come through. I think these are all big things that really, really help. Um, and the same goes for obviously all the other social media platforms, Instagram and things as well. Um, with social media, the truthful answer is I could do more. Um, and, I th and I think a lot of people could do more. Um, for me, I just like to go out and create stuff and share it. Um, that's what I kind of use social media for. So I suppose if people have connected with that, they've commented, I've taken the time to, you know, thank them for their time, you know, for watching and commenting. Um, and then you start to build up like a, a really nice kind of organic following, which is lovely. Um, so, yeah. That's actually not the first time we've heard that on the channel, that um, interacting with people is really important. Yeah, massively, yeah. So it's always good to thank your fans. <laughs> um, can I ask how you started getting bigger commercial work was that through social media or was that through your website yeah um the big the commercial work I think it's more and more YouTube now to tell you the truth um it was kind of Google search website um I found I find that with with the um people that come that route, they tend to be more local businesses, you know, people who might be searching for a filmmaker in the Southwest or in Devon or Cornwall. Um, whereas with YouTube, the reach is global. Um, and I think, you know, there's so much talent filmmakers wise on YouTube that, that you know, a lot of brands, I think, find, um, you know, people to collaborate with via YouTube. So YouTube has been huge for me, I think. <clears throat> um, pretty much most of the opportunities I've had recently have come directly or indirectly via YouTube um, and Instagram that does come into it too. Um, Facebook seems to be not so influential as it used to be. Um, so for me, it's YouTube. Um, that's really helpful. Um, we actually have a really great question that's come in as well. Um, I'm going to try and figure out how to phrase this one, but um, Matt Walker's asked about, delivery so what i remember when i started out obviously you would deliver the photograph and then you hope that they pay you that's as a beginner so mm. i guess my question would be as a filmmaker or a photographer how do you ensure that you're going to get paid for that work what are your methods around you know giving somebody a video and then not getting paid for it okay yeah um that's a good one obviously having a contract is important 
Um, that's a big one. Um, for me, so my process tends to be, you know, if um, a commercial client comes to me and wants to book me, um, I'll once we kind of agree on a budget and a fee for the production, then I'll take 50% upfront. Um, and then that's kind of a little bit of security for them and you. Um, it works both ways that, you know, you can now proceed. There might be things you've got to hire, depends on the job. Um, you've got that little bit of security that they've paid half. And then what I tend to do is I'll do, I'll produce like a first cut. Um, and I tend to factor in to my quotes, the cost of um, some adjustments, which are sometimes necess necessary. Um, and then I'll produce a final cut. And what I usually do then is I will post it to say my video, my Vimeo and send them the link that way for them to kind of sign off that they're happy. Um, so, and then ultimately, you know, not actually delivering the film in, until you've been and given them, you know, permission to do what they're going to do with it into, until you've, you know, settled the invoice. Amazing. That's fantastic. Um, and then a short follow up to that as well is somebody's asked about what you would do if someone asked for a refund. A refund. Oh, who, who asked that? That's a good question. Um, again, Matt Walker, so he's, he's asked. Matt's um, on fire. What, what, um, what would happen? <laughs> <laughs> what would I do if someone asked for a refund? I've never had it, thankfully. Um, I suppose in the contract, I don't have it to hand to read out, but in the contract, it, you wouldn't really be able to ask for a refund. I'm not sure. I would have to give that one some thought. I would think normally you would have a conversation and try and work out why it is that they want a refund. Um, and then you try to obviously put right what it is that they've, they're they not happy with. And you work between you know you and the client to to work something out and hopefully it wouldn't come to a full refund um but yeah i'm, I'm i hope to never experience that because I, I honestly don't know i'd like to think that you know you just work it out between you and being reasonable and you know caring about your clients as well at the end of the day you know so i'm sure you'd work it out you bit you know try and understand what it is they're not happy with and try and put it right i would say that would be my approach it's really interesting so it actually brings me on to a question we've asked a few different people on the channel and we've had quite a few different responses to it and oh. um, so when you're doing filmmaking projects or content creation are there projects that you would just outright say no to and if so why yes and i do actually um and i think again it comes back to everything else we've discussed that over time you work out um what what's your thing you know I, I i do honestly believe that um not every kind of video production job is necessarily for me um and if i don't think that i can bring um something to that then i might be inclined to say i'm i'm not sure this is for me um i'm sure there are people out there doing that kind of thing better than i am um so that's not to say that you know, especially early on, you should try everything, you know, um, you only get to learn what you, what you do like and what you don't like through trying things. Um, so definitely that, but I think as, as you've been doing it a while, you, you sort of get a sense of the things. I also think again, coming back to what I said earlier, that I think if you're really passionate about something and you really love that type of work that comes across in the end result, um, so for that reason as well, I, I like to focus on the things that I love producing, um, because then that comes across in the end result and that helps the client and it helps me as well. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say that, you know, if something, and it does happen sometimes, um, I'm quite lucky that I get lots of weird and wonderful things coming my way and that's the way I like it too. Um, but it does sometimes happen that you know, I do go back and say, thanks so much um, for, for your interest in me, but I'm not sure that I'm the right person for it. Um, and if I can then help potentially, you know, point them in the direction of someone who can. And again, this comes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, having a good network around you of people, you know, in your field and don't see them as competition, you know, they're friends and, you know, you all help each other out. Um, you may be able to point them in the direction of someone who who would be better suited to what they're looking for. So, yeah, I would say definitely. 
I guess it also comes back to that refund thing. You know, mm. if there's a job that you don't feel capable for, and I'm sure at this point in your career, you're probably capable of most of the jobs that come your way. But I guess if you're early on and you're a landscape person that's being asked to do editorial, then maybe say no. Absolutely. I, I think, and I think also when, when you do say that people really respect that you go back, they, they come back to you and say, thanks so much for being so honest. That's really good to hear. Cause ultimately they don't want someone doing this for them that either doesn't really like it very much or doesn't want to be doing it or doesn't believe that they're going to do a really good job of it. So they respect that. So I think that's a, that's a great thing. But I would also say that even now that it still happens to me that one of my biggest advice to somebody starting out would be to, do the things that scare you as well at, at the same time you know um if, if you've not done something before don't say no to it just because i've not done that before so for example fairly recently for me i had a a company come to me wanting some kind of product stuff um for a drink um and it, it involved you know pouring of drinks bit of green screen work that kind of thing and i hadn't done a huge amount of that kind of thing um and so i went into it a little bit like or, oh, you know, but because I hadn't done much of that stuff, I wanted to try it. And it just turned that turns out that, you know, they were absolutely over the moon with with the end result. Um, it received some great feedback. I had a really fun time and I learned a lot as well. So, yeah, so there's that's, that's the two sides to that question. I would say don't turn things down just because it doesn't seem to float your boat. If it's something you've not tried before, try it. Um, but at the same time, sometimes you do get the sense that maybe you're not quite the right person to to be doing this particular production. Good answer. Sitting on both sides of the fence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so we've had a great question come in um, around. <laughs> so basically, um, the question that Sean's asked is, if you could go back to the beginning of your career, mm. and have, like a skill that you never learn and learn it, what skill would it be? A skill that I've never learned and learn it. Yeah, right at the beginning of your career. Right at the beginning. Um, I would say, again, it's difficult because it depends on the line of work, but I would say learning how to tell a story um, out of everything. Um, because obviously there's so much that comes into filmmaking that's important, uh, as we know, but I would say telling a story and knowing how to kind of get people to connect with your work, that would be the number one thing I would say. So no matter what it is, if it's a wedding film, it's kind of picking up on the story and telling that story in a, in a motive way that people can connect with. Um, and I think we all love creating beautiful images. You know, I love it as much as the next person to create, you know, cinematography that looks amazing. But ultimately, if there's if there's no substance to it, then it's not it's not going to connect with people. Um, it will connect with, you know, other creatives who look at it and go, wow, that looks amazing. But it won't necessarily make people go, I felt that and yeah. I want to watch that again. Um, so I'd say that was probably that would probably be it. I'd say. Telling a story, study it, study it and try and find a way of connecting with people, whether that be f through um, the story that's there or, you know, the narrative or even music, just find a way to kind of connect with people's emotions. And, and that's probably the biggest thing you can do to your work really resonating with other people. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's great advice. Um, narrative content is always really interesting, yeah. but super difficult to make. Um, <laughs> Um, so we've had a question come in around the technical side. Mm -hmm. um, so Sid has asked um, about your focus method, which I think I can probably predict, but I'm going to hand that over to you. Um, I focus manually um, with a follow focus. Um, I've kind of always focused manually, especially. Um, so it depends really how I'm set up. So I've actually got that here. So. So for a shoulder rig, for example, is simply just the follow focus there. So I particularly like manual lenses. Um, how else? Um, gimbal. Um, so my primary camera is the GH5S. Um, so often what I'll do um, is 
with the Ronin S, it, which is my gimbal, you can actually connect the GH5S to the to the Ronin and then use the Ronin's focus wheel um, with obviously with lenses with autofocus in them. Um, so that's often how I focus when I'm shooting on a gimbal. But handheld and things, it's manual focus. Can I ask? So oh, we have a lot of. Um... We have a lot of different people that talk about manual focus in filmmaking. It's obviously really popular. Mm. Um, could you explain just a little bit about why that is? Because obviously in photography, autofocus can be quite crucial. So it's interesting to see the difference. Yeah, sure. Um, so really it's because even a very, very good autofocus system is deciding for you um, where, where to focus. And even the best of the autofocus systems out there look like autofocus, um, which is great for certain applications, of course. You know, it's really handy if you're on a gimbal. You might want to be just tracking a subject and it stays locked on and that's, that's great. But really, it's because you want to use focus. You want to decide where to focus and a nice slow focus rack, which you can't really pull off in the same way um, with autofocus. That's what it's all about. So you want to see nice, smooth, no hunting, you know, no jumping in and out of the focus. Um, which even the best out there, you know, will will do from time to time. Um, so yeah, it's really it's a creative thing, you know. Like any other, is it, what what do you want to focus on? If I'm focusing on the foreground and a slowly rack to your subject, so you're using focus to bring attention to what you want the viewer to look at, um, which isn't necessarily is it very easy to do with autofocus. It doesn't look as organic. Yeah, amazing. Um, I guess. I have a question for you about fulfilling briefs. So we've mm. talked a lot about commercial work. Um, and obviously when you're making passion projects, you can do what you want. When you're shooting yeah. weddings, there's nobody particularly guiding you and there's quite a set brief anyway. But how do you go about fulfilling your commercial briefs? Okay. Um, again, it depends on the job, the type of work, but on in terms of commercial, um, sometimes you'll have a commercial client come to you um, and they have no idea what they want. Um, but other times they'll have a very specific idea of what they want. And, and they're asking you basically to come in as almost you know, like a director or DP to produce their vision. Um, so it, it varies massively. Um, my first step in the process usually is to ask them two questions, really. Um, what is it you want and what do you want it to achieve? Um, and I would say that... Um, understanding what the message needs to be and and what it is they want to achieve with with the video is absolutely key to kind of working out what you're going to produce um i would say i i, I really enjoy the jobs where there's um not necessarily a really strict brief and you've got some um ability to be creative and normally what will happen is you ideas will come to and fro and then and then between you you come up with a, a really fantastic idea for it um other times as i said they've got a really specific um vision that they want you to produce for them um so once you've kind of understood what it is they want and what you know what this video needs to achieve um then you can start to look at okay well what what are you going to produce how are you going to do it um and then obviously you discuss fee and budget and all of those things and uh, yeah so that's kind of the process and then you know once they're happy with you know the plan um then you can start the proper pre-production planning um and and go from there thanks that's that's fantastic i think it's um always really interesting to see how different people approach it yeah definitely i've got two final questions for you cool. so the first question, um, I realise we can't go into too much detail about this, and perhaps it's a good excuse for us to have you back at some point. Um, <laughs> but um, somebody's asked about your editing software, which one you use, and whether you find that at the moment there's sort of more demand for heavier edits of content. Yeah, um, so I'm a Mac man, um, so I, I actually use Final Cut. Um, I started on it, and it does, and it you know it's always worked really well for me i love i think the main reason is because i love how stable it is and how quick and efficient it is um it doesn't crash doesn't freeze um it's fast rendering um and it gives me the tools that i need really there are certain things might have to do in something like after effects or something but 
my my edits are in final cut um demand yeah i mean obviously with as text progressing you know file sizes are getting huge and um one thing i would say is having worked now with atomos and lumix a couple of times on the prores raw um with the bgh1 and now the gh5s as well um i would say prores raw is amazing um and and it's it's keeping me on final cut because it's just it's the most amazing codec that it's massive you know it's, it's big files but you know your your computer just deals with it so nicely um and there's you know there's very little of it having to um it doesn't get clogged down it just plays back very smoothly and very nicely so prores raw is awesome when you're working on a mac in final cut so Amazing. that's keeping thank me you. with final cut for now thank you so much for sharing that and um i guess my final question would be if you could offer just a piece of advice to people who are either students or just starting out in the industry what would your sort of three top tips be three top tips okay um i would say one um focus on the th the th things that you love doing um because if you love them then they become an obsession for you and then that kind of comes across in the end result um so that would be one i would say secondly um don't try and impress other people do it for you and nobody else. There's, especially in this day and age of social media, there's so much pressure on people um, to, you know, and a, a lot, especially creatives, I think, uh, you know, I know a lot of people who have said to me in the past that they've been a bit scared to put something they've done out because they don't know what other creatives will think about it or it's not as good as what the next person's doing. Forget all of that, ignore it, do what you love and let it come from you. Um, and I think that's a, that's a that's key to it. Um, and then third, I would say, coming back to just trying to be a, this is the airy fairy bit. I'm sorry, but I believe it. Um, just being a good person, being good to work with, and you know, talking to others, helping others, giving other people your time, um, leaving your ego at the door because nobody likes working with that, um, and just being good to work with and stuff because ultimately that will only um be good for you um if people enjoy working with you no i think that's fantastic advice um albeit airy <laughs> um thank you so much for having uh, for being here today it's been Pleasure. amazing to just find out more about you um so could you tell us one final thing what's next for you oh um i honestly don't know and that's the exciting thing. Um, truly, you know, I'm, I'm just, again, it's another cliche, but I believe it. I'm genuinely just enjoying this process and this journey. And um, I, I say just kind of expanding more on what I'm doing now. Um, you know, I love working with brands and I like to do more of that and things like that. Um, like to have a bit more time for passion projects, to be honest, um, I would say, because um, especially the kind of last 12 to 18 months, it's been just a whirlwind. Um, I've not really had time for anything like that. I really love little passion projects. Um, so I'm hoping to have a little bit more time for that. But yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not one of these people that's got like a very clear ambition at the end of a road. It's, I'm just seeing where it goes, being open to opportunities and enjoying it. That's great. And thanks again for, for sharing with us. Um, thank you to everyone who watched. And of thank course, you for having me. No problem. And of course, thanks to Lumix for supporting us on this one. Um, keep an eye on our events website. We have some more coming.